I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, first of all, I'd like to ask if there's anybody from the news media that's here. Could you introduce yourself and let us know what organization you're with, please? Yeah. Okay, welcome. <laughs> Uh, this is a work session, so tonight uh, there will not be uh, any public participation. And as always, this meeting is being recorded, and tomorrow sometime it will be archived on our website. Okay, so let's move into um, communications um, review of agenda. Yeah, thank you. Uh... Chair Cotton, a couple of reminders for the board. Tomorrow night is the Legislative Roadshow. If you haven't signed up, please do. Uh, OSBA is making their rounds around the state and will be at the library tomorrow, um, 6 p.m., I believe is the time, correct? Uh, also, want to wish our uh, 6 o'clock, our Roseburg girls are in the gym now, taking on Westland and cheer our girls on tonight. Uh, right, currently right 15th in the state and looking forward to a good, maybe we'll have a short board meeting. We'll make it over there. We'll see. Uh, and also just a quick FYI on the review of the agenda. Um, uh, we have added, uh, pursuant, you'll see of the agenda, um, to the ORS there, the, uh, the superintendent evaluation check-in, uh, that was, um, approved by the board of that process. And, and, uh, that's been added, uh, because that date came up on us kind of quick of October 25th. So we've added that to the agenda. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to move into discussion items and we're going to hear from uh, Director of Sur Student Services, Melissa Roberts. So it's yours. Thank you. And thank you for allowing me to share about the Office of Student Services. I hope I do our wonderful staff and students justice and how hard we work to make sure our students get the care and the support and the instruction that they deserve and need. So if we just turn to the next page, Office of Student Services, who do we support and how do we support? A lot of what we do is mandated by federal law and also state law and then our district regulations and policies. But we serve our largest population through our special education students. So students that qualify for individual education programs that require specially designed instruction. In addition, we serve students on Section 504 contracts. Section 504 is again, a legal contract that supports students that have needs that require additional um, time or additional space or accommodations so that they can access their learning. We have McKinney-Vento in our department for our displayed or displaced and homeless students and families. We also have our Department of Human Services contact. So if we have students that are um, students that are wards of the state or that need support for transportation or that need other supports to help them access their learning, we have a person that connects that person's caseworker to their appropriate school. Our department also supports in suicide screening. So we have a policy that we do the training with to make sure that our students that are in harm of them, harming themselves have support and we have a, a very outlined procedure in supporting them. We also help with behavior supports. So devising behavior support plans functional behavioral assessments, really digging in on what the behavioral needs of, are of students. So we have plans to help support them be successful. We do risk assessments. So if we have occasions where there is a crisis or there is a concern, we can go in and we have policies and practices and how to determine that level of need and support. And that could go outside our school system. 
We also support crisis intervention prevention, which is our restraint training and processes. The biggest part of this is not to restrain, but actually build the toolboxes of our staff and helping students learn how to manage their behaviors. Next page. So special education is a service and it's not a place or a destination. So we know that students go into special education programs, but our goal is always to push them forward and get them in the least restrictive environments and get them moving forward. So when we get an eligibility, that is just to help us determine what the tools are to help those students receive the resources they need to access their education and to maximize their own success through their educational journey. So staff within our department, I do have a typo here. We have six school psychologists and I've been told we're pretty progressive. There is a national shortage of school psychologists. So of those six, five of them are virtual. We have a school psychologist that um, lives in Portland. We have one at Coos Bay. We have one in Bend, Oregon. We have one in Dallas, Texas, and we have one in Washington, D.C. We also have an in-person one here that um, relocated from Alaska two years ago. In addition, we have one school psych intern that works with our school psychologists. We have two instructional assistants that help our virtual staff do their job as they're supporting students. We have two behavioral support specialists that are actually teachers on special ed assignment to help our behavioral support plans and behavior ventures. We have also a speech and language pathologist on special assignment. She currently is our teacher at our Emerging K classroom at Hugh Crest. We have the McKinney-Vento DHS support liaison. We have an office manager. We have an administrative assistant. This year, new to us, we have Lisa Dickover as our coordinator and myself as the director. So teachers and consult that help serve our students, we have 32 licensed special education teachers. We have um, 13 currently, 13 paperwork managers at our elementary level. We're also looking at revamping that process. So it will be three district staff doing the job of 13. Um, and then we have uh, three people that do the paperwork management at our secondary levels. In total, under our special ed department, we have 124 instructional assistants. Speech and language, services, our vision services, our hearing services, our nurses are all contracted through our educational service district, as are, as are our occupational therapists, our physical therapists, our autism, our autism spectrum disorder staff are also our ESD employees. So we have several programs, and so I'm really proud to talk about some of these programs, starting with our most um, profound learners. We have the program called the Complex Learning Classroom, and that is housed at our Fir Grove site. While it's housed at Fir Grove, it really is an ESD program. It's for the entire county. And it serves students that are from kindergarten age all the way to the age of 21. To qualify for this program, students have to be pretty fragile learners. They need support with bathrooming, often medication, they have health concerns, they also receive support for feeding and toileting, and they receive their academics. Another program we have at our Fir Grove site is our profound um, developmental learning center. This is a district program that houses students K through grade five. It's an outstanding program that works with students that also may need support with speech and language. In fact, last year, every single student in that program, which was a total of 18 students, had support with aug augmentative speech and communication devices to allow them to communicate. Um, 
These students often need hand over hand support for their academics, also, also often can use support with bathrooming. It is very um, close, a lot of adults supporting our students in this program, and it is housed at our Fir Grove site. Additionally, now for moving up steps, we have developmental learning centers throughout the district that are district programs. These programs are also largely self-contained. They do again support students with their academic needs, but also functional needs, including speech, including bathrooming, including language, adaptive skills and living skills. So learning how to button coats or zip zippers, um, sometimes learning how to brush their teeth and comb their hair could occur in a developmental learning center. We have those programs at our Hughcrest site just started last year, at our Melrose site, at our Fir Grove site with our profound classroom and at our Sunny Soap site. And then for the high school and middle school, we have one at our Fremont site and one at RHS. Moving from there, we have our elementary resource and secondary resource centers. These are for students that need support with daily living skills. It is again, um, can be a maintained classroom where students do the majority of their learning in this classroom. Often when students are able to access though, we're encouraging them to move outside the classroom. So here students are working on their academics, but also on social skills, living skills, communication. Um, we see a lot of adaptive skill building in this classroom. And then at all of our sites, we have learning resource centers. And learning resource centers support our students with special needs that need help with behaviors, that need help with reading, writing, math, supports for social emotional. And as I said, these are at all of our schools. We also have some additional special programming. So new this year is our Emerging K classroom that is housed at our Hughcrest site. We're really excited about this classroom because this classroom specifically supports kindergartners in our programs so that we can give them specialized instruction to try to bolster some areas that might not be where their age-like peers are. And it's giving us some extra time when we get ready to place them in a program that we have data and we know for sure and we're confident in that program they're going to be placed in. We have a program called Pathways at our high school site. Pathways serves our students from the age of 18 to 21. Pathways really supports students that are continuing to work on life skills and work skills. If you haven't been to the Pathways house, go. It's awesome. <laughs> And we also have behavior support classrooms. So at the elementary level, it's called the turnaround program. Also at our middle school level turnaround program, but at the high school, they call it their success classroom. And this classroom specifically addresses behavior supports and teaching students how to regulate their own emotional learning and also building skills about self-awareness and social emotional skill development. We have our elementary site at Fullerton 4 currently, and then we have Fremont and Joe Lane both have programs, as well as our RHS site. So who do we serve? In total, currently, we have 874 students that are either currently on IEPs or in the process of determining eligibility. At the elementary level, that's about 499 students. At our mid-level, that's approximately 162 students. And at the high school, that's 213 students. In addition, we serve our students on Section 504 compacts, and that currently is approximately 328 students. We've been tracking numbers. And so last year, last spring, we had 21 students graduate from Roseburg High School that were receiving services on IEPs. And we had two students that exited from our Pathways program for a total of 23 students graduating from Roseburg High School last year that received special education services. 
but to kind of bring this into view a little bit about our incoming numbers. Last spring, we welcomed 86 students entering this fall in kindergarten that now are on IEPs. So big numbers coming in, trying to get them where they need to be and the support they need so that hopefully our goal is so that they can outgrow the need for our services. And that, my folks, is it, unless there's any questions. So you have a number of virtual teachers. How does that work? I mean, is it is it pretty effective? I, I would imagine it's not the same as having someone in person, but. So we have virtual school psychologists. We have some virtual speech and language pathologists. I was really hesitant about um, bringing virtual into our programs. So we started out slow. Our first person was our gal from Washington, D.C. Um, we It works out great. Andrea, because we have staff that can, so if they're observing a student, we have an instructional assistant that takes the computer to the classroom. That instructional assistant can um, assist during assessments. We have um, the technology for them to be able to do those assessments, even though they are a distance. Those in our state of Oregon, we also um, encourage them to come on site and we're supporting them coming on site at least four times a year. But surprisingly, it is effective. I have a, just that last slide you showed. You said 86 students are entering with special education in kindergarten. How, who determines at such a young age that they need to, to be Very in a program question. like that? So we have early intervention programs. That would be our head start. Um, and just our early intervention. We also have preschool even in our own district. And uh, the neat thing about that is there's been a lot more funding and a lot more attention in that. So that students are getting interventions earlier. So their screening are happening sooner. And so just as we have our special education at the school age level, they have what's called an individual family and student plan, which is like an IEP to help them receive the level of support they need, even as preschoolers. So once, once, you know, say that the general population of kids come in to first grade, second grade, and so on, <clears throat> how is it determined that they need to go in this program? Does a teacher recommend it or is it recommended by parents? How does that work? Um, so we have a law that's called Child Find. So anyone can um, bring to the attention of the school staff that we may have a student that may need supports outside what they are um, providing or that the student's able to access. So referrals can come from parents, can come from staff. When we have older students themselves, they can notify staff that they need more assistance or that they have a concern. So it could be community members coming in that might know a neighbor or so it's called Child Find and it can come from a variety of resources. We also have programs within our district in which we look at our education and what we're providing and what our interventions are doing. And we're monitoring that and we're paying attention to how students are responding to that. And that might also be a trigger for us to look deeper into the needs of a student. Mm -hmm. Um, on the, the 13 classified paperwork managers, mm -hmm. what paperwork is being required um, and, and how is that turned in or how do we follow up on that uh, or what, how do you follow up on that? So it would start with an initial um, referral into looking at a student. As you go through the special education or even 504, these are um, contracts. These are, um, there's a lot of paperwork that's required. And I hear some people giggling back there. Those individual education programs can um, be very lengthy. And so the paperwork managers are making sure all the signatures are on there, that we're following the proper process, 
from starting to meet the parent to going into an evaluation planning meeting to look at eligibility to having the yearly IEP meetings to having the triannual um, checks for eligibility. We have 504 compacts. We have to look to see if they qualify. We meet at least once a year. Okay, so they, so they help us manage all of that paperwork and make sure that we have the proper signatures, the proper dates, the proper people at those meetings. Okay, It's a lot of work <laughs> and we're very appreciative. They also contact parents and they're scheduling the meetings. One more uh, question on that is so a 504 then is that is there act, um, extra funding then that takes place for these students because with all the paperwork and all the paperwork managers this is just regular ADA funding. I'm gonna let Cheryl speak on the money. <laughs> Um, for students who are on an IEP, we do receive an additional weighting from the state. It is capped at 11% of our entire population in order to prevent um, over-identification of special ed students. But yes, 11% of our population up to is uh, eligible for a second weighting. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Not for 504 for uh, students on an IEP. I'd like to follow up. I, I, I apologize. I I don't think I was asleep, but I thought I heard you when you were made a comment about the 13 classified paper managers, and then you threw in three. We are so so what's how how are you gonna go from you just told me how much paperwork there is and there's 13 and you and then you told me you're going to three. Was that a, a mistake or no? How, so do how are you doing up? that? No, so um currently each school can determine the individuals that will be doing their paperwork. And there's more than one special education teacher at most of our schools. So it could be more than one person actually doing this paperwork. Because we have such an increase of the number of students we have in special education, um, thank you, HR, has worked really hard in helping us try to find a process that would be equitable to all of our schools. So we came up with a formula for each teacher, special ed teacher that we have, we call them case managers. They will get a minimum of one hour of paperwork management per day. We hadn't really had a process that really made it equitable between all levels. And so we're trying something new. We are in the process right now of training three individuals and their sole job will be elementary paperwork management and they will spend an hour a day with their assigned case managers. We're really excited about that. That will allow the IA staff that we currently have do the paperwork working now with the children in the classroom with their instruction. So we're really happy about that, but we're right in the midst and we haven't transferred over to okay. that process well, i'll yet. be able to sleep tonight because i was trying to figure out the formula <laughs> because if that's the case now i have one other question i and i should know this and i apologize but the total number of special education students is 874 mm -hmm. and you mentioned 499 in elementary and then it drops down to 162 so that's because we've got them so can you explain you know if we're coming out of elementary, we have 499 kids, but then we get to middle school, it's 162, and then it goes back up to high school. How's that possible? So we watch these numbers a lot. If you, Our middle schools are only three years, right? Our elementary have K through five. So we have more grade levels um, and total population in our elementaries is larger than our middle schools would be a reason why you see that. Um, and some exit, as Jill said, so we have some students that grow out of the need for services, which is our always our goal. Okay. Um, in the, uh, you said that 21 of the students graduated this year and then two from 
pathways. Now, are those uh, diplomas that are, have been adjusted or what are they, what was modified? modified? Are they're modified diplomas? I'm gonna let Dr. Weber speak to this piece. She might know. I, I can't tell you exactly, but there are, uh, thank you. There are um, students who graduate um, who have been receiving special education services with an absolutely regular diploma, just the extra supports. Um, sometimes there are students who receive a modified diploma that may receive special education services and others that may have a modified that don't receive special education services. Mm -hmm. And um, there are other types of um, completers as well. And in fact, we've talked about at the next CNI meeting to talk about diplomas and the different types of diplomas. So I could actually get that data for you for that meeting. Okay, great. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. You did a very nice job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah. What is collective bargaining? I guess you're heads that up. Uh, that's a good question. I'm here. I'm here to learn. I don't know. Okay. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Melissa, and your team for supporting all of our students and staff and community members. Um, proud of the kids we have and staff working with our kids and for the design and openness to rethink and get after different ways to help support students. And I appreciate that. All right. So tonight I uh, wanted to spend a few minutes uh, to talking about the collective bargaining process. What is collective bargaining? And I did make a couple of amendments um, as I've been sitting here to this. So mostly in your slide deck, but you can follow along. See everybody I work with saying, yeah, he does that a lot. All right. So let's talk a little bit about collective bargaining. So um, I'll talk, we'll talk a little bit later about employee groups and some of those, but let me just talk about the basics of collective bargaining. Um, so collective bargaining is a few things. It is, um, it is the negotiation, negotiation of employment terms between an employer and a group of represented employees. It is also the law and in Oregon, it is the law to collectively bargain to do this work together. And that is the law. And it, it leads us to the third bullet there that it is a collaborative process. Um, and then I think what's really important and oftentimes missed in collective bargaining is that it is an opportunity for an organization, in this case, our school district and its employees to work together to help create a contract that values them and their work. I talked at the beginning of the year with all of our employees about we want people to buy here, not to rent. And if we think about the importance of retaining our talent in our, in our organization, we want the best people in this community working with our kids. We need them working with our kids. And we also need a contract that allows us to recruit people from outside the area. And that's really what this does. It's an opportunity to do that while balancing the needs of students and balancing the district's financial health. Um, I often talk about, you know, the collective bargaining for me reminds me a little bit of a three-legged stool where you have in an organization, you need to have a really strong culture there. And that culture needs to be one that you love to work at. And there's a, there's a purpose in that culture. And the board's done a great job in helping shape that culture around the strategic plan. So you want to have that piece. You also need to make sure you have a contract that's strong, that people see their future there. They see that, again, they want to be there. They see themselves retiring from there making that their life's work. And you also need the supports to support people in that. And so it's that balance. Collective bargaining reminds us there's a balance of culture, supports, and contract. And, and that's what that is. Um, in terms of our employee, and feel free to jump in anytime with any questions. We don't need to wait to the end. Um, we have four uh, employee groups. Now, the numbers of employees are listed here. Um, our licensed employees are oftentimes either called licensed or certified employees. This is certainly our teaching staff, anybody that has a TSPC certification. Um, there's a variety of different um, types of licensed employees. Uh, we heard about some today. Um, it might be um, speech and language pathologist. It, there's, a, there's a range there of what that could be. Um, our licensed employees um, we have 394 licensed employees serving kids here. They are represented by the Roseburg Education Association, and we collectively bargain with this employee group. Our classified employees, we have 348 classified employees that do a variety of things. 
Uh, we oftentimes call them the backbone of our schools. We simply can't uh, do our work without either one of these employee groups. They are represented by the Oregon School Employees Association, and we collectively bargain with this group as well. We have two other employee groups. We have um, eight confidential employees. This would include Janet and Steph. You work with them most closely, but we have some confidential employees in HR and the business office as well, a total of eight. And um, they and our administrators, and this includes both our administrators in the building as well as managers and coordinators, uh, total 33, and neither one of those groups we collectively bargain with. Um, we have an agreement with them, but they're effectively at will employees, and um, we still they're still protected by labor law in Oregon. We still have a, a process that we go through with them uh, for our contracts, but we don't collectively bargain with those employee groups. All right, let's talk a little bit about our current uh, agreement, our current contract or agreement. Um, we are um, in the middle, so. Um, now, two and a half years ago, uh, we had all four of our employee groups entered into an agreement with the district, um, different kinds of agreement. One is a contract and one is an agreement. Uh, we sign a contract with our um, two associations and, and um, we're in an agreement with our uh, administrators and confidential employees. All three of, so all employees are um, effectively um that we bargain with are in a three-year contract. And that expires June 30th of this school year in 24. Um, relative to the financial compensation of that, for those of you that were here, I'm sure you remember this, for those of you who weren't, the three-year agreement called for a 4% increase in the first year, a 3% increase in the following year, and a 2% increase this year. Um, last spring, um, the board did approve an additional $1 per hour raise for our classified and confidential staff and a 2% raise for licensed and admin staff. Um, uh, so effectively became a 434 instead of a 432. Uh, in terms of the process for how collective bargaining um, begins, uh, there's something called a demand to bargain. That kind of sounds a little bit rough. It sounds like, but that's just the language of that. And uh, the association will send that over indicating that their teams are formed and they're ready to sit down and start that process. Uh, as you likely know, OSEA, our classified staff, have submitted a, a demand to bargain. We expect that our licensed staff um, will uh, send a demand to bargain here in the next couple of months, and we'll hope to start later this fall with that. Contracts can be uh, multi-year or single-year. Um, I'll just go on the record to say I'm a fan of multi-year contracts. Um, and uh, that's what we've had in the past in the school district for the most part, and hopefully we can get into a multi-year contract to provide the stability our students and staff and community needs. Now, collective bargaining also has a, really two pathways for dispute resolution. And I, I put this in here with no um, uh, intention of assuming that we're going to need a dispute resolution process. Um, so uh, please don't read anything more into this, but I thought it was important to indicate that there really are two pathways for dispute resolution. Uh, in Oregon's collective bargaining agreement, the, the way the law reads is when both sides exchange proposals, it begins a 150 day timeline, if you will, to come to an agreement. And that's indicated in that first um, arrow there. If, uh, if um, we'll just talk about school districts right now, if a school district and an employee group are unable to come to an agreement in that 150 days, there are a process of steps that happen. This process uh, that I'm going to share with you today, there's two processes. Um, one of the processes involves um, a contract that allows for a strike. Uh, the last for striking. And we've seen this uh, in um, you know school districts across the region. We've seen this in healthcare companies across the region, the UAW right now. We see this in other things with the other strikes in Hollywood and some of those things. So that's one process. It's a little bit more, uh, it's a little different process, has some of the same components. Our employee groups have a no strike. Uh, we have no strike provision there. So we don't have, um, there's not a strike, there's not a striking um, pathway in our current agreements. And so this pathway is 
for school districts that have a no strike clause. So I won't, don't need to spend a lot of time on this. I don't think this will be something that we anticipate happening, but just so that you know, there's a process that then involves some mediation, some cooling off, arbitration, um, and we're looking at uh, following a couple school districts up north that are um, have are somewhere in this process. There's a little different, uh, some of the districts, um, but there is a process for resolution if uh, if an agreement cannot be achieved. And again, I don't think that will be our case here. It's really important that um, we have adopted and continue to talk and design around a strategic plan. This becomes the North Star as we think about collective bargaining. Um, as we think about the, the responsibility we have to students and staff and the community and to make sure that our students get the care and support instruction they need to graduate. Um, and the things that are involved in this plan, that is how uh, we will approach the collective bargaining process. And it's really important to have that. And I wanna commend the board for that. Um, relative to a couple of financial things before I finish here that are important, I think, contextually as we think about the collective bargaining process, about 80% of our uh, general fund is what pays um, uh, to help provide the services we need. So we think about this, it's about 80%, about 78%, I think, if my math's right. Um, of the money that we receive from the state goes into paying for people. Schools are are heavy on people. This is a people business. Um, unlike some companies that may spend a lot in materials, um, we spend on people. That's what we need. We need people working with our kids. And so that's, uh, I think, important number to think about Um is we think about you know where our budget is. Our budget is where it needs to be in terms of the support for for educators. That's where the majority of the dollars sit. The state school fund. There are a couple of uh, revenue streams that come in, but I, I it's important to realize that the state school fund. So every two years, there's a biennium, and schools receive a portion no. of those biennium dollars. Uh, the the state school fund is the Oh, you got that, Michelle. Thank you. The state school fund is um, the that is the fund we will use to be able to pay for our collective bargaining work. It doesn't come through grants. Um, it really, the state school fund will be the 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 pot of revenue we'll use to to settle our collective bargaining agreements. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, let's see. I would just uh, finish up by saying this: um, staff are. I've said this oftentimes. We have great amazing people working with our kids. We're so thankful for our staff, from our administrators to our confidential employees, from our classified employees to licensed employees. They are fantastic. And everything we do that we're proud of gets back to the people that we have in the organization. We love our kids. They're incredible. We adore our community. Our staff do amazing things for students. And that's in every aspect of that, from teaching and learning to making sure kids have the, you know, that they can eat and get the care they need to making sure the buildings function and work, that the heat's on, the computers work, and children get to school and stay safe. Um, staff are really the heart of our school district. So again, in, in conclusion, and I can answer any questions that you might have, uh, we're looking forward to a process that's collaborative with our um, employee groups. Um, and we're looking forward to a process that will recognize the great work they do in service of our kids that, um, hopefully for them and for us provides a measure of stability for them um, and for us and for our kids. So with that, happy to host any or answer any questions you might have. Yeah, I'm looking at the finances. Um, it says that my first note, it says nearly 80% of general fund pays for staff and, edu mm -hmm. and educate directly support students. Then, then the second one is um, state school fund pay for the majority of salaries and benefits. Hmm. So, I mean, yeah, so, so pay for the majority of it. Why are we, why is it, we're still paying 80% out of our general fund? Is there just not enough? Yeah. General um, fund is, or is our state school fund. The, okay. the general fund is the money that comes from the state. Oh, okay. So yeah. oh, that money goes in. Yeah. There. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, I think you know we've we and uh, I think it's a I think it's a great clarifying question. I, I should have written that a little clearer, so I apologize. Um, we do have. I mean, there are there are other uh, grants. And Title One comes to mind. There are some other revenue streams, um, but that uh, the state school fund is really the fund that allows us to provide the people that are necessary to meet the the board's expectations. What is, what is that based on uh, as far as the dollars that do come from the state? How do, how do they evaluate? Is it per student? Yeah. And they decide how much they're going to give us per student. Right. So there's a, the process is a, um, the process is a political one. Um, so in Oregon, um, we work on a biennium budget. And this is actually a, a good point because oftentimes contracts are, so we're in the middle of a, of a biennium right now. And so this is a kind of an ideal time to to look at collective bargaining because we actually know what the revenue is going to look like for next year. So the 24, 25 year, we actually know what's going to come in. Beyond that, we have we don't really have a clue. Oregon doesn't have a floor for funding like some states. Washington has a floor for funding, which, you know, CFOs appreciate. I think superintendents and boards appreciate. You have an idea of what that funding is going to look like long term. And for those uh, people who were here like in 08, um, not having a floor is problematic because you're not sure what your funding is going to look like. Um, so we, so the going back to the 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 question, um, we have a biennium budget that's determined by the legislature um, each year. We and so we hope to see a bump in that every two years, but we're not exactly sure. Um, and it depends on a variety of things, depends on the economy, depends on politics, depends on how the legislature will or will not work together. So this last, the last session we just had, the last long session was a good example of what it looks like when people really don't want to work together or can't work together. Um, and it's, this is not, this is not to pick on any, both parties do this. This is, so when you either don't show up to, to want to govern, um, and so, uh, so the process is oftentimes political. It's certainly dependent on where the state's economy, where the reserves are, um, and, you know, essentially how each individual interest bargains themselves and lobbies, because anytime at the legislature, you'll have a variety of groups from police and fire to schools to, uh, you know, Department of Human Services, there's always an ask. And so the process is political in terms of what the what the revenue looks like. But we are grateful. I am grateful, I'll speak for myself, to be able to bargain this year coming up, knowing what our revenue will be like in 24, 25. That is set already. And just so um, in case I think the board knows, but in case members of the public don't know, the binding budget is delivered 49% of the revenue in the first year and 51% in the second year. And so we have a pretty good idea of what that number is going to look like. It's intended to, to pay for, you know, if, in our case, if there's, you know, COLA costs, inflationary costs. Let's hope that that helps. Anything else? Okay. Well, we are coming to the end of tonight's work session. Um, before we um, adjourn this meeting, we do have two executive sessions tonight. And I just, I wanted just um, to go on the record and I'll do this again when we get executive sessions. But the first executive session we're gonna go to go into is ORS 192-660-H and it's to consult with council concerning the legal rights and duties of a public body with regard to current litigation or litiga litigation that could be likely be filed. The second executive session we will go into is ORS 192-6602-I, and it's to review and evaluate the employment related performance of the chief executive officer of any public body, a public officer, employee, or staff member who does not request an open hearing. I'm gonna go a little bit further because he's not in trouble. <laughs> On July 12, 2023, the Board of Directors adopted the Board Superintendent Operating Agreement and proposed check-in schedule for the 2023-24 uh, year as the conduit to evaluate Mr. Corden's performance as Superintendent of Roseburg Public Schools. And we've done this 
for a few years. So tonight is one of those check-in times when we get to um, listen to him and he gets to listen to us and it's a, it's called the check-in. And then we'll meet again on the 13th of December. And then we'll do it again in the, a couple of times in the spring, fall. It's really an important process. So he knows um, uh, where he stands, if there needs to be improvement or if things are going great or if, or if we need improvement as a board. It's a two-way, it's a working agreement. And it's it's fabulous. It, it helps us with our North Star. So that's what we will be doing in the second um, executive session. So the next regular meeting will be the 15th at Eastwood Elementary, and we're looking forward to seeing you. And it'll be at 6 p.m. So I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you very much. Oh, I forgot something. Are we going to do a Skype yeah. presentation? Yeah. It'll be earlier. 445 for board members. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you yeah. Okay. 445. And you'll be doing the tour? Cool. Okay. We're going to take a five minute break, board members.